This is Heart Rhythm TV. I'm Roderick Tung. Today we're joined by Paulus Kirchhoff from Hamburg, Germany, and Christine Albert, the president of the Rhythm Society. We have a very important late breaking trial, the East trial, that's being published today in, co in collaboration with ESC as well as the New England Journal of Medicine. Welcome, Dr. Kirchhoff and Dr. Albert. Thank you. Dr. Kirchhoff. Congratulations on a fantastic, large-scale, real-world clinical trial. The EAST trial set to look at nearly 3,000 patients, 135 centers, primarily based in Germany, this AF network. And you were really asking the question of whether early in intervention with atrial fibrillation improves outcomes in those that are recently diagnosed, early AFib. Can you tell us a little bit about the investigators and the rationale for putting this blockbuster study together? Yeah, so first of all, it's really a privilege to be able to tell to the world what we have found. It's been a huge team effort comprising 11 European countries, also the European Heart Association, and a tremendous team of people. I can't name them all, but you'll find them in the article. Um, when we started the trial, I mean, we all know the firm, we all know race, uh, but many of us believed, and I believe, that maintaining sinus rhythm is actually good for your heart. It's better than having atrial fibrillation. And we sat down and thought, what are the things that went wrong at the firm? One of them is that it stopped anticoagulation, which was not at the time, but that's not the only thing. The other thing is that we know that um, atrial fibrillation causes severe and permanent damage to the atria after a few weeks or months. So we thought intervening earlier should make rhythm control easier and thereby safer. And when you look at epidemiological data, for example, from the Framingham study, you also find that the first year after the first diagnosis of AF is a very dangerous time. Mortality is higher, hospitalizations are more common. So it's also a time where you can actually gain the most if you want to reduce outcomes. And that's why we focused the trial uh, on patients who had atrial fibrillation diagnosed less than a year prior to enrollment. And with regard to the treatment strategies, can you tell our viewers about the types of rhythm strategies and the most common medications that were implemented? So I'll first tell you the things that everyone got. We randomized patients in two arms, early rhythm control and usual care. Everyone got anticoagulation and indeed over 90% of all patients were anticoagulated at baseline and after two years. Everyone got treatment of concomitant cardiovascular diseases and use of ACE inhibitors, heart failure medication, anti-diabetics was very good, blood pressure was well controlled. So we all had the right background treatment. Everyone received rate control therapy. In the usual care group, rhythm control therapy was, as we have in our guidelines, limited to patients who were symptomatic on rate control therapy. In early therapy, everybody got rhythm control therapy from randomization onwards. And we had some protocol guidance that was very much aligned with guidelines which antiarrhythmic drugs to use if people chose antiarrhythmic drugs and also how to perform AF fibrillation, mainly focusing on pulmonary vein isolation to make sure that the procedures are safe and quick. Um, the actual choice of rhythm control therapy was left to the treating center. And it looks like in the methods that about 20%, about 19 to 20% of patients actually receive PVI. And that's why this is so different from a firm and grace in that PVI was included in this as rhythm strategy. So tell us about the big drum roll outcome. So the, the, the outcome was, I mean, to be honest, uh, better than we thought it would be. So we found a clear cut 21% hazard reduction in the first primary outcome, which is a composite of cardiovascular death, stroke, or hospitalization for worsening of heart failure or acute coronary syndrome. Of the 1,395 patients randomized to early therapy, 249 experienced such an event. Of the 1,394 patients randomized to usual care, 316 experienced such an event highly statistically significant difference, the ambulized event rate was reduced from 5.0% to 3.9%. So a massive reduction in my view, on top of what you can achieve with current guideline recommended therapy. We also did a good subgroup analysis, testing 19 pre-specified subgroups that influenced the primary outcome. And the finding were super consistent across all subgroups. 
including asymptomatic patients. We enrolled about 30% asymptomatic patients, uh, very obese patients, patients with and without heart failure, uh, patients with a first episode of AF. Almost 40% of the patients were enrolled with their first episode of AF a few days after they had been diagnosed. Actually, the median time between first diagnosis of AF and enrollment was 36 days. Yeah, no, Paul's, first of all, congratulations. I mean, what a tour de force. A, a, a 2,000 person, you know, EP study following people for five years. Uh, that's incredible. And to find these results that all of us have suspected for so long, but have not been able to see in any study. Um, one of the things that, that I think it would be interesting for you to comment on is, is how is the difference between um, ablation and drugs? Did you seem to find any difference in any particular group in the way that they were treated, how it impacted the income, the outcome? So um, we have to be clear in the first top line answer, we tested a rhythm control strategy that combined anti-aerobic right. drugs and AF ablation. And all our findings apply to that strategy. I personally believe that there were several reasons why East AF Net 4 came out different than Affirm. One is we now have ablation so that we can treat the difficult to treat patients better. Two, we know better how to safely use antiarrhythmic drugs than we did 20 or 25 years ago. So uh, we have a good feel on, for example, when you can use black which was one of the most commonly used drugs. And three, I also think we have the advantage of treating early so that it was actually easier to maintain sinus rhythm so that the more dangerous things were less often needed. I should and probably also mention that one feature of the intervention was that all patients in early rhythm control received a telemetric ECG. And so the site was alerted as soon as they had recurrent AF, so they could adapt therapy quickly when recurrent AF occurred. And could you talk a little bit about the patient population that you tested? Now, these weren't all patients with atrial fibrillation. They were pretty high risk, right? Higher age and CHADS VAS score. So exactly. So basically, uh, we had two main inclusion criteria. One was early AF, so AF of less than a year duration or accepted. And the other was they had to have cardiovascular risk factors. So basically approximating a chance of us score of two or, or more. And that leads to enrollment of a population that is a decade older than the typical population trials. So the mean age was 70 years. We had almost 50% women, 30% um, of heart failure, um, so you have the typical, if you wish, all-comer elderly AF population. And I find it actually quite remarkable how safe rhythm control therapy was in um, that population, similar to what our colleagues in Cabana have found, where the safety of either antiarrhythmic drugs or AF fibrillation was actually very good in this at-risk population using our modern methods. And what was the rate of um, complications from that? It was a slightly higher, wasn't it? Um, but low. Yeah. So our first, uh, our, our primary safety outcome was a composite of death, stroke, and serious adverse events related to rhythm control therapy. And they were all predefined and adjudicated centrally, so we're very sure that we captured all of these events. We had numerically fewer deaths in early therapy, 134 versus 168. We had numerically fewer strokes, uh, 40 versus 62, but we had, of course, more adverse events related to uh, rhythm control therapy. But over the five-year follow-up, only 68 patients, 4.9%, experienced uh, serious adverse events re related to rhythm control therapy. And that could be anything from bradycardia due to antiarrhythmic drugs down to tamponade after ablation. And 1.4%, um, I think 19 in the usual care arm also experienced such events because some of them, 15% after two years, were actually treated with rhythm control therapy at a later stage. Great. Dr. Kirchhoff, there is no question that your trial is going to be discussed at countless journal clubs from here on forward because the last time we had such a large trial to answer this question or ask this question was a firm which was in 2002. So this has really been long overdue for over 18 years. We've been waiting for this. One, one of the questions that we will be discussing will be that the, the results of this was often, was largely driven by stroke, a reduction in stroke, where we also note that you have around 82% of patients that are maintaining sinus rhythm with these strategies. 
Does that mean that while all of them, about 90% are still in our anticoagulation, does that really question the idea that despite anticoagulation, the maintenance of sinus rhythm still reduces stroke? So I think um, the first thing to say is the trial was powered for the uh, primary outcome, which is a composite. And uh, when you look at the numbers, we had fewer cardiovascular deaths, we had fewer strokes, we had fewer heart failure hospitalizations, we had fewer acute coronary symptoms. So numerically, the difference was consistent in all the components. Stroke was relatively rare in both arms, and I think that shows how powerful anticoagulation is. But I would argue that cardiovascular death is worse than stroke. Um, so prevention of either of these is important to our patients. And uh, coming back to your introduction, the, I think the main journal club message, the one-liner, is that we should really offer rhythm control therapy to every patient with recently diagnosed AF based on the results of, of that trial, which also means that every patient with recently diagnosed AF has to be seen by a heart rhythm specialist who knows how to prescribe antiarrhythmic drugs and or to perform AF relation. And, and looking at this next side by side with Affirm, Affirm really had nearly 50% and over 60% in the end using amiodarone and sodalol, the class threes. And what your group of investigators did was primarily utilize you know, class 1C agents, flecainide, propafenone, as well as dronetarone. Yeah. So do you think that is what's most likely that you're seeing more benefit with the rhythm control arm? So, and I mean, we've, we've thought about this at the start of the trial and we have a clearer view now. I think there are two key things that one has to re remember from the firm days. One is anticoagulation was stopped when sinus rhythm was restored and after one or two holders. So, the benefit of anticoagulation was, was actually withheld from the rhythm control arm in the firm, at least to some extent. Two, um, we didn't have AF ablation, and therefore combination of anti-arrhythmic drugs were used. We actually had a fair amount of patients on amiodarone. We are doing the sub-analyses, but obviously this is not a randomized comparison. I don't think that using amiodarone per se is not a good thing. It wouldn't be the first line treatment for us unless the patient has heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. But it is a very powerful drug in those patients if you can't do ablation. So I think it's a combination of all these things of um, withdrawal of anticoagulation, the ability to maintain sinus rhythm better because we have AF ablation and we know the drugs better. And thirdly, potentially most importantly, but I don't know, of course, um, most of the patients enrolled in a firm had been in AF for several years. Mm. So it was just harder to maintain and restore sinus rhythm than in patients with recently diagnosed AF. And I do think this is a key difference of East AFNet 4 compared to all other rate versus rhythm control trials. And also compared to Kibana, um, when you look at maintenance of sinus rhythm. Christine, do you think this is going to change the opinion of all of our general cardiology colleagues? Well, I think that it, it should. Um, it may be difficult to get into practice because it is such a game changer. I mean, nowadays, the first thing we always do, and especially in older patients, is to pursue rate control. Um, and so being aggressive like this in patients who are over age 75 is going to be a difference. Um, but clearly the data show a benefit over time. And I think that's what's really impressive, the amount of time that you follow the patients and you see those Kaplan-Meier curves or the cumulative incidence curves go and, and widen over time. So that there is some benefit, it seems, to pursuing atrial fibrillation early on. So Dr. Kirchhoff, Christine and I want to congratulate you on a really well-executed, much-needed trial. It's been 18 years since this discussion, and it's going to be very exciting for the EP community to discuss the EAST trial. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss this with you and uh, for the platform that you provide to share our results with the wider community.